Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the second day of the Vierne at 150 Festival. My name is Christopher Houlihan. I'm here with Olivier Latrie, who is, of course, uh, the organist of Notre Dame Cathedral since 1985, uh, professor of organ at the Paris Conservatoire, and an international performer and recording artist. Olivier, it's so nice to be with you here today. Thank you for joining me. You're very welcome. Uh, I thought I would just ask by asking, uh, how are you and, and how are things in France? You mentioned to me that you're starting to play recitals again. Is that, is that true? Uh, yes, it's true sometimes, <laughs> because in fact, uh, I don't know how it is in the US uh, right now, but uh, sometimes, you know, we, we plan to play a recital and then three days before, we say, well, maybe we don't know. There is some uh, uh, restrictions about the uh, uh, entrance in the country, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we never know. Uh, my wife and I had two concerts in, in Switzerland last week, and we had to change our plans just to be able to enter the, uh, the in Swiss in Switzerland because um, uh, they decided to reinforce the security. Uh, for, for the French people, so it was very difficult, but finally we, we could get there, it was not very easy. And same problems uh, happen now with Germany and etc. So we'll see. Exactly, that's all we can do these days. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Are, are there any people in the audience when you do play a concert or is it? Oh yes, yes. yeah, yes. Uh, it's pretty full. But full, <laughs> How, <laughs> as we can now, uh, which means, for example, I played last month in uh, uh, Leipzig, in the, the Thomaskirche, and uh, they decided to double the concert, one concert at five and uh, another one at eight or something like this. And then that helps, of course, to have uh, more people. Uh, th it's not possible to have more than 280 people there for one concert. So that means that uh, we had doubled. Uh, audience, which is fine. <laughs> twice it's, not, it's not that easy for the organist, of course, because we have to play twice the same program and it's difficult to concentrate for so long. But well, that's life. We hope that it will be something else in about a year, or something, maybe before. <laughs> we hope so. Um, let me turn to, to Louis Vierne. Of course, this is uh, the, October 8th will mark his 150th birthday. Um, he was born in 1870 in Poitiers, France, and became organist at Notre Dame in 1900. And then, of course, famously died at the organ in 1937. And I just, you know, I'd like to, to place Vierne in the context of, of Notre Dame a little bit, because it's not only a famous an important place for organists, but it's a, a pilgrimage site and a monument to all of Western music. It's, it's said to be the place where harmony really first began. Um, and I, I'm sort of wondering, when did Notre Dame have its first pipe organ? Um, uh, it seems that there, there, there was always a pipe organ at Notre Dame, even during the building. Because when the cathedral was not totally finished, there was an organ uh, uh, hang on the, on the nave, uh, on the right side, a little bit like chart or mess, for example, a, a very small organ. Uh, and this organ stayed there until 1425. And, and the big organ uh, at the place that we know now, at the west uh, and the side of the cathedral, was installed in 1402. So for 25 years almost, there were two organs, uh, <laughs> big organs in the cathedral. Wow. And then we still have some pipes from the, uh, probably from, from that time, uh, six or nine pipes, I don't remember. I saw them once uh, during the last restoration. It's very moving, you know, to see those old pipes, a little bit like an old man or old woman, you know, with the, 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 uh, the, the you know, the, things everywhere on the skin and that kind of thing. Yes, yes. And the same for those pipes. It's uh, very, very touching. Wow, from 1400 in the current pipe organ. That's amazing. Um, how does the organ we know today, or, or normally know today, differ from the one Vierne knew? Sort of, uh, you know, he, I know that he made some changes to it during his tenure. Um, and of course, it's very different than, than the one from 1400. But what is what has changed over the last 150 years or so? 
uh, first the, 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 the organ was electrified by Cochereau during the 60s. Uh, and uh, then uh, I'm not sure that there were some change, changes before uh, Cochereau. Leon de Saint-Martin kept the organ on the last statement like Vienne uh, did in uh, seven, uh, 1932. Uh, then in, maybe we should speak also about what happened in 1932, uh, because the organ uh, by Cavalli Col was a little bit uncomfortable because the swell was the fifth manual and the first manual was the, the, the keyboard where all the manuals could be coupled, but there was no intermediate couplings between the, uh, the other. For example, no possibility to couple the swell to the positive or swell to the bombard, etc. Everything had to go through the grand coeur, which was the first manual. And then uh, th there was a, a pedal lever for the, for the swell box on the right side, and which was very uncomfortable when you was playing, we were playing the, uh, the swell, you know, which was the fifth manual, uh, having the, the low C on the left foot and then the, 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 the right foot on this lever pedal for the, um, for the swell box, which was almost impossible to do. Not, not like the swell box we're used to, just like sort of a, a, a notched, so exactly. But you know, it's, uh, it's very useful for some of the effects in Vienna's music. For example, when you play the, uh, the final of the third symphony, um, uh, when you have this forte piano at the beginning of the piece, then it, it, it works much, uh, the effect is much uh, efficient with this, uh, uh, this uh, lever than with the pedal, because you never have time to, to open the box and close the box with the pedal. And it works very well with the, the spring of the, of the pedal lever. Uh, so um, then, uh, of course, many stops were added by Cochereau, uh, the chamad, <laughs> the mixtures and all of that. And at the last restoration, we added also, uh, we enlarged, in fact, the, the, the petit pedal by Pierre Cochereau. Mm. And it's now possible to play this petit pedal also on the manual as a, uh, full division, which is a floating division, which can be played anywhere on the organ, on any manual, and it, it's called resonance. Wow. So even just in, that was, what year was that restoration completed? The last one was uh, uh, six years ago. Six, six years ago, wow. And we have to do it <laughs> once okay. more right now. <laughs> well, that's nice. I, yeah, what, what can you do? Um, I was thinking about, I, as I understand it, uh, you know, Vierne went away to Switzerland for many years to undergo yes. eye treatment, and and at some point came back to Notre Dame after World War One. And uh, is it true that the organ was in quite a bad state at that point? Um, yeah, this is what he said in his memories. Yes. So that's probably true. true. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know exactly what how the organ was, but, uh, well, it was always some problems at Notre Dame at any time. I don't know why, but, you know, this, it's part of the story on an instrument uh, that, for example, the instrument is uh, on a bad shape most of the time, uh, which happened in Notre Dame quite a lot, I, I must say, uh, because it was the case in 19th century, it was the case during the Viennes time, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, it was the case also at the last uh, years of Cochereau at Notre Dame. So uh, this is part of the story. <laughs> and well, that brings us to today. What, what is the state of the organ right now? What, what needs to be done to make it playable again? Uh, almost everything. So we are very fortunate that uh, the, the pipe, pipes didn't melt uh, with the, 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 the fire. Uh, the organ is not destroyed. Uh, there was just some uh, water in two or three pipes of the, of the 32 foot. That's it, which is a miracle, really. It's a miracle. And it is the same for most of the uh, liturgical uh, elements of the cathedral. The statue of the Virgin, for example, uh, stayed uh, as it was before. Uh, the main altar, uh, the, uh, the stalls, uh, everything which is in relation with the liturgy is still there, which is uh, uh, yeah, really incredible. And uh, so for the organ, uh, of course, there was a lot of lead everywhere. You know, that's, that dust coming from the, the fire of the, of the roof. And uh, we have to uh, 
uh, remove everything. This is the case right now. The organ is uh, taken out right now. Uh, it will last five months. And uh, after that, uh, it will be the decontamination of every element uh, and then the restoration. And we, we hope that the organ will be there uh, maybe in 2023 to be playable for, uh, for the um, Tedeon in uh, April 2024. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, most of the elements, for example, the, the, I don't know the name for that, you know, the les peaux de mouton, uh, the, 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 not the skin, I don't know, uh, every, everything which makes... Uh, uh, like the leather, is that... A, a probably, probably the leather, yes, right. The leather needs to be replaced wow. everywhere. So it will be a big, big uh, amount of, uh, of, of work. So you said it's going to take five or six months just to remove the organ. Yes. Right. Thing starts. Yeah. Wow. That, yeah. It's an incredible yes, because it's not very easy for the people uh, working there. You know, they have to, uh, to make um, the, 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 the work with a, a combination and they have to wear a mask also uh, to breathe, not to breathe the, uh, the, the lead uh, and, and all of that. So it's very, very difficult. I imagine that the COVID pandemic must have slowed some of this down. Is it, is it, uh, did, did work stop for several months on the cathedral? Uh, at the cathedral, yes, it stopped last year for almost two months. And also for the organ at the beginning of the restoration of the, uh, the taking of the organ, the, um, they, the, the, they put the console uh, out and then they, they had to stop for three weeks just to, to be sure that the scaffolding would be okay and the security uh, would be okay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it took a lot of time. It's, yeah, I, quite a complicated project on its own and with the pandemic on top of it, I, I can't imagine. Yes, right. I was kind of wondering about a, a couple uh, relics of sorts that are in Notre Dame. I, I remember that the bench that Vierne died on was in the loft. And right. also the organ console that he played on was in a room in the, in the tower to the side. Did, did those also survive the fire? Yes, without problem. So it's absolutely fine. Yeah, as well as the, uh, the, the case of the Ruc uh, Positif, which is hanged in this uh, room uh, above the console. And, uh, and uh, so it's still uh, there, no problem. Wow, I, I guess I didn't realize that. That's a division that used to hang on the on the gallery rail of the of Notre Dame. Yes, fascinating. Uh, I guess that brings me to a, a question, maybe a silly question, but with this restoration, will will everything go back exactly as it was six years ago, or are there any plans to to while you're taking it out to change anything about the organ? No, we hope uh, it will stay like it was uh, six years ago because um, uh, it was not an easy process to, to uh, reach that point uh, six years ago. Uh, for example, at the last restoration, previous restoration in 1992, some things were made very quickly, you know, because the, the organ builders were, were in a hurry and they took that time in uh, 2014 to finish what was not uh, probably done uh, in uh, 1992. So I think we reached the point where the organ is really uh, coherent, the sound is really well balanced, and I hope we will find that uh, afterwards. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an exciting, I mean, when I think of the sound of Notre Dame, I, the first thing that comes to my mind is how exciting it is to hear it. I don't know if that's just the shamads <laughs> or if it's something about the room or, or, or the acoustics, but what is it, I mean, how would you describe the Notre Dame organ and what makes it so magical and fantastic? Well, I think uh, the, there's the organ, of course, but there's also the, the, the volume and the, uh, the acoustic of the cathedral, which helps to make the organ sound like it sounds really. And uh, this is really a, a mix thing between this acoustic and, and the organ. 
and Cavallecol uh, had the chance, <laughs> it is really a chance, that um, uh, Viollet le Duc, the architect, uh, asked him uh, to change his plans during the, the building of the restoration of the organ uh, during the 1860s. Cavallecol was supposed to build an instrument with four manuals. Uh, with no 16 foot on the swell, for example, um, uh, 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 bombard uh, keyboard uh, with all the reeds, uh, something, you know, like uh, it did several times in Saint-Omer, etc., etc., etc. So it's much smaller yeah. than the organ he built. Exactly. Smaller and not that interesting. Very standard organ for Cavallecol. And when uh, Viollet le Duc asked him not to use the ruc positif, then Viollet le Duc said, uh, Cavallecol said, okay, but in that case, let me do what I want. And this is the point where the, the, sham, the, the uh, cl clarinet, 1684, arrived, the all flute harmonics, the, the, the harmonics, uh, uh, you know, range uh, with the eight foot until the septim, um, 16 foot also with the septim, and 32 foot with the septim of the pillow. So it, it tried to experiment many things at Notre Dame, especially because of the acoustic of the cathedral. And it's, that's why probably the organ is so well, uh, sounds so well in the cathedral. That's really, really, really interesting. So when given sort of carte blanche, he, he really, he branched out and added these somewhat peculiar uh, additions. That's, that's fascinating. Yes. And he tried also to have this uh, uh, read chorus, which were all different. So you, I was speaking about the clarinet, but there were also the uh, the basson, sixteen and four, um, uh, the and uh, the, the big reeds on the uh, bombard, uh, the reeds uh, which were the reeds by Clico on the swell. Uh, so it, it was really a very interesting one. But. So this must have influenced Vierne, of course. And uh, yes, does, does, sure. Uh, without going into too much detail, I mean, does that? Uh, does that show up in his music somehow? You mentioned the, the finale of the third symphony with the slamming the swell box shut, but are there any other places where you see that he was thinking of Notre Dame? Of course. Um, many pieces, for example, like the uh, Gargouille et Chimère, uh, um, yeah. Cathedral, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, but not only when you, uh, you play, for example, the scherzo of the uh, sixth symphony, he was also speaking about the, the gargoyles there. And um, it's not only this evocation of Notre Dame, uh, but also the, the way of the harmonies. Uh, you can very, you, you can uh, remark that uh, most of the time, the harmonies by Vienna are, are very long. When you play, for example, the Carillon de Westminster, you are on a G major chord for, for a long time, and the same in many, many pieces. And this is also something which is related to the acoustic of the cathedral, where it's not possible to have too much polyphony, too, too much uh, harmonies, etc. So, and this is what makes the, uh, this relation between the music of Vienna and the cathedral. Interesting, interesting. Uh... I think of the fin the finale of the third symphony when in the recapitulation where the theme comes back comes back very slowly, right? And yes. the way that it would would fill have to fill the space. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. And uh, there is also also something uh, special with the organ by Cavallecol with the music by Vierne. I think it's important to mention that uh, the organ by Cavallecol uh, had these mutations. And the tutti, the full organ, was very different when you played on the bass, on the middle, and on the, on the tribbles. Uh, on the bass, you could uh, not hear any of the mixtures or mutation. So just the sound even of the reeds. Even during the tutti? Yes. Wow. And uh, it's still like this now, depending what you use. But if you use the cavalier color organ only, then it sounds like that. And then the mixtures, and the mutations come just only at the top of the manual, which means that when you play, for example, this final from the third symphony of Orcarillon de Westminster, you hear three different sounds uh, by playing on the same manual, because you hear, for example, the Carillon de Westminster, ta -di -de -ta, you hear that with all the mutations, you hear the, the, the movements with the 16 notes on the middle uh, with uh, uh, a very um, 
well-balanced sound, and then you hear only the reeds on the pedal, like the brass on the orchestra. It, it has a different character and different orchestration throughout the, the compass. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's fascinating. That it's it's uh, the the music takes on its true character on an organ like that, right? You really yes, discover things. And there is also something that uh, uh, was told to me by some students by Vierne, uh, André Fleury, Gaston Lutez, Jean Bouvard, uh, Jean Langlais, and Duriflet said that too. That um, Vierne played at Notre Dame with other registrations that what was written on the score. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, uh, because uh, if you wanted his music to be performed by other organists, he had to make a, a simple registration on the score uh, for a normal organ between 35 stops and uh, 45 stops. But of course at Notre Dame, where they had many other stops like the mutations, he yeah. used these mutations much more. And uh, I remember, for example, Jean Bouvard was a, a student of Vienne, uh, telling me that in the scherzo or the second symphony, you have to use the mixture. Of course, the mixture is not the plein jeu or cymbal, but the, 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 the little uh, stops like the uh, Larigo, uh, Nazar. Uh, wow. And this, this appellation, mixture, is also something which is used by Messian. Uh, and it's very, it's very important to, to keep that in mind because it's, um, it gives another character of the music. That, that's, a, that's a great point. The, 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 the point is that it should sparkle in a way. And on some organs, it's 842 is fine. And you know, if you have Notre Dame, it's, it needs to have the same effect. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yeah. Yeah, of course. I, I think yeah. the, the, in the introduction to the piece de fantasy, where he says exactly that, this, these are sort of uh, indications for your typical organ, but uh, just ideas of colors and sounds. Yes, exactly. For example, um, playing at Notre Dame the, uh, uh, the Allegro Vivace from the first symphony with only uh, flute eight and four on the swell just doesn't work. <laughs> you need to have at least a, a two foot, maybe a Nazar or something like this to couple with other manuals. It's, uh, you had to feel the place. Yes, right, of course, wow. And now I'm imagining him trying to play that on the fifth manual. <laughs> be, be, quite, yes. be quite difficult. But in fact, you know, there are many, several places at, in the Vienne, Vienne's music, but not only the same with Messiaen and, and sometimes Dupré, where you can only play on the first manual. That was a French tradition. Mm. You, you never lift the hands to the fifth manual. You stayed on the first manual, and when needed, you just couple the, 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 the keyboards. Right. For example, the, the, the first uh, movement of the first symphony, you start on the swell, and then you go on the positive, and then you go on the, on, on the great. And I'm absolutely convinced that VM played that everything on the, uh, on the first manual, on the grand coeur, only with the uh, swell coupled to the grand coeur. And when the positive comes, then he, he, he adds the... Um, the positive to grand coeur, and then the grand tour to grand coeur, and then he, he had all the manuals together. Uh, I, I think of the the Jigu Takada. I think that's the way he registers it. He tells you to to do that. Yeah, exactly. Oh. It, it is a French tradition. You know, French organists are a little bit lazy. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, no, I, I I I don't think so at all. <laughs> um, wow. It's because we are not French. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but it's uh, uh, for sure. It's uh, it's normal, you know, to try. The, the organs were so also sometimes so difficult to play. Uh, the, there were some cavalier called organs with Barker levels only on the on the great and no on the positive and not on the swell. On the best case, there were some on the great and swell, but not on the positive. And then uh, when you went on the positive, it was so heavy, almost impossible to play. I so the only, way is just to, the only way is just to remove the copula grand orgue. Then that means that the Barker level doesn't work anymore. And then you have the positive as well, without having to play on a very heavy keyboard on the positive. And do you think that's why when Vierne 
toured in the United States. He, he seemed to fall in love with Skinner organ consoles. They were comfortable to play, is that? Probably more comfortable than the French organs, yeah. Is he, I think, it, did he want to have Skinner build a console for Notre Dame at some point? Was that a thought? I don't know if it was a Skinner console, but it was a console with a lot of uh, uh, combinations and things like he, he, he saw and he played in America. Yeah, and colored like, like the Wanamaker organ on the stops, I think. Yeah, <laughs> but he wanted to make a lot of things. We have the project of VM uh, for Notre Dame. Uh, he wanted an organ with 100 stops and he wanted also to... Um, to change the, the location of the grate, which is on the center of the organ right now, just in, in front of the swell. And he wanted to put that on the two towers on, on each side where we had the resonance right now, to put all the manuals there and, and, and to, yeah, to, to, to build a big, bigger organ. And, and enclose some of the divisions, is that? Uh, that was his first project, but finally, uh, Victor Gonzalez told him that it was not possible especially because of the swell, which was behind. Yeah, yeah, it's very remote, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, is there, I know there's a long way to go until the cathedral and the organ is restored. You mentioned that maybe in 2024, it will be open again. No, um, no, it's not maybe, it will be in 2024. <laughs> excuse me, yes, in 2024, it will be open yeah. again. And yeah, it has to be. It has to be has to be. Yeah. I, I, uh, we are not sure that it will be totally finished. Uh, maybe outside uh, some work will still be done, but at least we will enter in the cathedral at the latest in the two, uh, 2024. That's something wonderful to look forward to. Yeah. Are you, as I understand it, they're putting the cathedral and the organ back exactly as it was, even building the inside the attic, the, the, the timber is the same exact way. Is that is that yes. correct? Wow. Yes. It, I mean, there must be so much attention to detail to do something like that. And, but acoustics, I would be worried about the acoustics returning exactly as they are. Are you worried about that? Well, I used to be worried at the beginning uh, of the discussions after the fire. But everybody told me that uh, we don't have to worry because it will be exactly the same. You know, the, the, the stones are so thick, so it, should be, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, whatever we have uh, above the, 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 the roof, it's not a problem because the, the, the stones will make the acoustic. Yes. Wow. Well, that, that's, that's encouraging to hear that it's going to be, be like it was because it truly is an unbelievable place. I remember the first time I heard the organ at Notre Dame. I was 18 years old and you graciously let me sit in the organ loft while you were improvising at mass. And um, it was my first time in France and first time hearing a French organ and it is no sound like it in the world. It's just an incredible place. Yeah, for sure. And I can, you know, I'm, uh, I thank God each time I go to the cathedral just to, to play uh, for, for any kind of situation for, for a mass for a rehearsal or something like this, because it's, uh, I know how lucky I am to play that kind of instrument. What, what do you think you're going to play first when you can get your hands on the organ again in Notre Dame? <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> That's great. Um, there will be so many things to play so that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I wonder, as we're approaching the end of this interview, um, what, you know, I, I, I wonder what you would tell someone who's never heard the music of Louis Vierne before, or is even unfamiliar with organ music, uh, or unfamiliar, I know we can't imagine someone not liking organ music, but what, how would you introduce them to the music of, of Louis Vierne? What, are there any, composers that his style is similar to um, you know if someone who, who loves music but just doesn't think they like organ music what would you say to them about Guillermo? Well it's difficult the the, the, the closest to Vienna would be Franck um, and I think it would be a good introduction not to hear the, the organ music first but maybe some of his chamber music Vienne's or the piano music yeah. And if people are not familiar with the organ music, then that would be a good introduction to his language first. 
and then through the language go to the uh, uh, organ music. The piano quintet is particularly uh, beautiful, isn't it? it or not, a, not only, also the, uh, the, the, the violin sonata and all of that. It's, it's, yeah, it's very nice. And it, I, there's a parallel there to Franck's piano and chamber music. You know, it's, it's very clear. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, yeah. That's a good good introduction. Yeah. I remember speaking with Gaston Littes about that. Uh, what uh, people thought about Vienne uh, during the 1930s, and he told me that when he played some music by Vienne to his friends at the conservatoire, they they found it was uh, very nice music and uh, and uh, very uh, musical uh, effects. It, it was. It was not only organ music for those people. Yes. yes. And I should say, for those who don't know, uh, Gaston Littes, of course, you're one of your teachers and uh, a yes. pupil, of, pupil of Vierne's, is that correct? Yes, he was a student of Vierne and also a very good friend. In fact, uh, the Monsieur and Madame Littes went to, uh, to Louis Vierne to, to, to make a visit to Louis Vierne every Saturday. Wow. And uh, just like this, uh, to, to, like some friends who want to meet. And each time, Vian uh, shakes uh, Lite's hands and said, oh, those big hands are, are made to play, uh, to play organ for sure. <laughs> so perhaps, uh, perhaps Vian would have celebrated a birthday with, uh, with the, the Lite's. Uh, can you, do you have any idea what they might have done to celebrate Vian's birthday? Oh, I, I really don't know. What were the customs at that time? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's just a funny, fun to think about that. Um, oh, no, yes, for sure. <laughs> but you know, Vian was not some, someone, of course he had many uh, troubles during his life. Uh, uh, he was not a lucky person, oh. but he tried always to survive to those problems. And uh, uh, he had a great sense of humor. Uh, everybody says that. And that I think is very important. Also a story with Littes, for example. Littes once played at the radio the final from the Sixth Symphony. We started you know, with ta da dee ta da 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 and then ta da da ta da da dee dee And uh, then the next Saturday, Littes uh, went to Louis Vienne as every Saturday and asked to Louis Vienne, so what did you think about my performance of your piece? Because he knew that Vienne was listening uh, live on the radio. And he said, oh, you played very well, but you forgot to bark at the beginning. In fact, Littes, uh, when he played this music, never practiced the, the first chord, ta da dee -di. Da, 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 but always started with da, 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 and because he was used to do that he did also the same for the for the radio and he forgot these uh, first four bars and uh, this is what Vien said barking like a dog barking like that's <laughs> I'll never think of that the same way again <laughs> it is this uh, yeah that's <laughs> That's so funny. I, you mentioned Vierne's sense of humor, and um, I think that comes through in his music. It, it seems it seems to come through for me. But I think a lot of his I met. I obviously uh, I didn't meet Vierne, but it seems like his music is very personal. We have the sense of humor. We have the the the, the beautiful lyrical melodies, and there's this angst often. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I can say also two stories about that. There is uh, one with. Um, um, with Littes and also Langlais, both said the same thing. Uh, they say that Vienne uh, told them, if you want to play well one of my scherzo, the people have to laugh at the end. If, you, if the people laugh, then you play on the right way. It's like uh, a punchline at the end of the second scherzo. For example, yes. And, um, and, and it is something which uh, I think went uh, further. For, for example, when you play the barrier uh, intermezzo from the symphony, it is exa exactly the same thing. So this is one thing. And the other thing about the, uh, uh, the musical aspect of Vienne, this is Le Chanoine Doyen, who was organist at the cathedral in Soissons, who was having a lesson with Rivian and played the, the adagio from the third symphony. And at the end, Vian didn't say anything. And then 
after some seconds, he just said for himself, how beautiful it is. That's it. Wow. He, he was a very sensitive and funny man, it sounds like. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That, it is, wow. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, sharing these stories about Bjorn and, and, and Notre Dame. I, I so appreciate it. Is there anything, is there anything I forgot to cover or, or that you'd like to tell me about Bjorn or the cathedral? Um, uh, anything I've, I've missed? I think we covered most of the, of the subjects. There's, there's... You, could speak for, you could speak for hours, you know, on that kind of subject. Or about where. <laughs> That's exactly right, Olivier. Again, thank you so much. I so appreciate it. I am looking forward to 2024 and to hear you playing at, at Notre Dame again someday very soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>